So welcome to Gardening with the Masters presented by Sandoval Extension Master Gardeners. Today we welcome Matthew Peterson who will be discussing Bosque Tree Health. Matthew is currently the Botanic Garden and Heritage Farm Manager here at the ABQ Biopark. In his previous role, he was a Bosque Forester with the City of Albuquerque's Open Space Division. During that time, he gained several years of in the field experience managing the Bosque and collaborated with a variety of agencies on habitat restoration projects within the middle Rio Grande. He is also an International Society of Arboriculture Certified Arborist. In his free time, he enjoys recreating on our public lands, climbing mountains and observing the wildlife that inhabits those places. Matthew. Thank you, Padgett, and uh, thank you all. And thank you for the Sandoval Extension Master Gardeners for inviting me to speak on this topic. Uh, and thank you again for enduring yet another Zoom presentation after what seems like more and more of a virtual world we now live in. John Thompson, uh, who some of you may know, he and I met about a year ago for lunch when he first asked me to present on this particular topic. Uh, the world in our daily lives would soon change after having that lunch meeting uh, so it's great to be here today with you all uh, to speak about Bosque Tree Health. So that's me there, Matthew Peterson, uh, Botanic Garden Heritage Farm Manager here at your ABQ Biopark. Uh, below is my contact information and also the website to the Biopark. So I hail from the state of, uh, of Ohio, the Buckeye State. I received my degree uh, from the Ohio State University. Never did I think I would move to the desert and still be able to manage a forest. Uh, and I was terribly wrong in thinking that. So nearly a decade ago, I assumed the role of Bosque Forester with the Open Space Division. The Open Space Division being the city entity that manages nearly the 30,000 acres of public lands, including the Bosque here in town. So enough about me, more about the Middle Rio Grande. So first, the extent of the Rio Grande. The Rio Grande begins in South Central Colorado and flows to the Gulf of Mexico. After passing through the length of New Mexico and along the way, it forms part of the Mexico-United States border. According to the International Boundary and Waters Commission, the Rio Grande's total length is measured at 1,896 miles in the late 1980s, though course shifts occasionally result in length changes. Depending on how the Rio Grande is measured, the Rio Grande is either the fourth or fifth longest river system in North America. The Rio Grande rises in the western part of the Rio Grande National Forest in Colorado. The river is formed by the joining of several streams at the base of Canby Mountain in the San Juan Mountains, just east of the Continental Divide. Here you see a photo of myself that's me on the left and a childhood friend of mine making our way along the Continental Divide Trail into the Rio Grande National Forest on our way, in fact, towards Canby Mountain. It's our hope uh, to one day trace the Rio Grande from its headwaters to the terminus into the Gulf of Mexico. Well, we've only done very little uh, and we have a lot more to do. So from the San Juan Mountains, it flows to the San Luis Valley passing through the Rio Grande Gorge near Taos and Española and picking up additional water from the San Juan Chama Diversion Project from the Rio Chama. The Rio Grande continues on a southerly route through the desert cities of Albuquerque, Las Cruces del Paso, and Ciudad Juarez. So our focus for today is the middle Rio Grande, also known as the Albuquerque Reach, which is from the Angostura Diversion Dam on the southern, southern boundary of Santa Ana Pueblo to the Isleta Divergent Dam on the northern boundary of Isleta Pueblo. So the middle Rio Grande Valley in central New Mexico grows a large cottonwood forest, more commonly known as the Bosque. Gnarly twisted cottonwood trees, Populus deltoides with lensii, the Bosque's dominant species grows along the river the Rio Grande cottonwood collected by Frederick Wislenzius in 1846 and 1847 on a trip from St. Louis through New Mexico, northern New Mexico, 
doesn't need to the cottonwood of western Colorado, most of New Mexico, far west Texas, northern Arizona, and eastern Utah. People use the bosque for recreation, education, and for some, it even has spiritual meaning. The cottonwood tree specifically is held sacred in many tribes of the Southwest. Populus is Latin for people and the classical Latin name for the tree. Deltoides refers to the leaf shape and is from the Greek alphabet letter delta, thus triangular. Oides, which means similar to, cottonwoods being in the popular family. Cottonwoods are dioecious, which means they are separate male and female trees. And according to the lit literature, as free edifice, Latin for self-rooting, they're dependent on shallow alluvial groundwater linked to stream flow, particularly in semi-arid semi climates. Reproduction of the cottonwood is also key to hydrological conditions, whereby seeds are distributed in large seed rains, typically synchronized to late spring runoff and associated flooding. Germinating on wetted ground only, they quickly extend roots following the wetting front of the receding groundwater as discharge falls in the soon summer months. So current day, there are several stakeholders involved in the active management of the Bosque. Federal stakeholders being the US Army Corps of Engineers, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Bureau of Reclamation. State agencies such as New Mexico Game and Fish, Office State of the Engineer, or also known as the Interstate Stream Commission, along with New Mexico State Forestry, all have active roles in Bosque management. Local agencies, including the City of Albuquerque Open Space Division, my former employer, along with the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority and the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District. Non-governmental agencies, include Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, also the Middle Rio Grande Collaborative Program, University of New Mexico, Department of Biology, the Sierra Club, Rio Grande Chapter, along with Save the Bosque Task Force. To the north of Albuquerque, tribal entities, such as the Pueblo of Sandia and Santa Ana, and to the south, Pueblo Isleta. It's also important to mention the various fire agencies, Albuquerque Fire Rescue, Bernalillo County Fire, Sandoval County, and the Corrales Fire Department also have a vested interest in managing the Bosque, both to mitigate the potential for wildfires and also extinguish wildfires that may occur. And of course, the public, all of you and myself included, who like to go bird watching in the Bosque, or perhaps even paddle down the river itself. Or if you're a cyclist, one who may enjoy the Paseo del Bosque Trail, or simply just go for a nice walk amongst the cottonwood trees. While this may not be a comprehensive list, it certainly gives an accurate representation of the collaborative efforts of many different agencies and also the public and non-governmental agencies involved in Bosque management. But first, a brief history of the Rio Grande to gain a better understanding of how we got to where we are today. When Bosque de Coronado first reached the pueblos of the Middle Rio Grande Valley in 1540, he found that the native communities had been irrigating extensively for hundreds of years. This is an early photograph, aerial photograph of Albuquerque from circa 1915, showing a wide meandering river. With adjacent irrigated lands for agriculture. I really like this photo in the sense that the Rio Grande was once a wide meandering river. And there's some indication that perhaps the river stretched all the way to what's now Petroglyph National Monument to current day downtown Albuquerque. It was around 1918, a forward thinking conservationist and champion for the Rio Grande named Aldo Leopold landed in Albuquerque. In the early 1900s, while most people fought for their right to water, Aldo Leopold 
Leopold fought for the river's right to water. Otto Leopold would later to help create the middle Rio Grande Conservancy District and promoted the establishment of what would become the Rio Grande Valley State Park, what we now know as the Bosque. The MRGCD, or the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District, was created to provide flood protection from the Rio Grande, frame swamplands, and provide irrigation water to farmlands. It was in 1918, 1919, Aldo Leopold served as the Secretary of Albuquerque Chamber of Commerce and pushed for the creation of a Bosque nature park that would protect this critical ecosystem. By 1935, the Conservancy District had built the storage dam at El Vado and the diversion dams at Cochiti, Angostura, Isleta, San Acacia to manage its water. In 1941 and 42, floods again threatened the middle Rio Grande Valley, which was the flooding event that now resulted in many of the remnant mature cottonwood trees in the Bosque today. Many of the cottonwoods now being 70 to 90 years old. It wasn't until 1983 when Aldo Leopold's vision of a riverside woodland would be realized when the New Mexico State Legislature created the state park, as we know as Rio Grande Valley State Park. The Rio Grande Valley State Park is made up of 4,300 acres of riparian habitat along both sides of the Rio Grande, stretching from the Sandia Pueblo to the north and to the south to Isleta Pueblo. The Bosque is managed cooperatively, cooperatively by the City of Albuquerque's Open Space Division in the Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District through a joint powers agreement shown here on the screen. Jumping forward 100 years to present day, when we no longer cross the river in a hot horse-drawn carriage, environmental conditions along the Bosque have changed significantly, leading to the drastic need for habitat restoration and reclamation to maintain critical habitat for a variety of species. According to Cliff Crawford, as a result of flood control measures, the Rio Grande has been changed from a wide, shallow, meandering river that frequently flooded to a straight channel that is incised in the north and aggregated in the south. From 1935 to 1989, 42% reduction in wetlands. There was a 69% reduction in scrub shrub and also a 49% reduction in the river channel itself. So the biggest factor in the Bosque's future has simply been human impact. In the late 1800s, the people living near the then wild meandering Rio Grande were getting tired of constant flooding and understandably so. What they didn't know at the time was that they were also removing a large amount of cattails, cottonwood seedlings, and even species of fish. In 1941, the last of the great floods in the Bosque took place. After this, the people took action. They built a dam to control flooding and laid down jetty jacks in order to limit de debris damage. Cochiti Dam was constructed in 1969 through 1975, primarily as a flood control dam. Some of the first installations of Kellner jetty jacks, more commonly known as simply as jetty jacks, were installed along the Rio Grande in New Mexico in the 1950s, prior to the dams being built. Jetty jacks served the purpose to reduce velocity along the bank to promote sedimentation to protect the river bank, essentially forcing the river into a desired channel. By 1962, 115,000 jetty jacks were installed, creating a stable channel from Cochiti to Bernardo that had vegetation growing on the banks. Much of that vegetation was non-native plant species that require lots of water and served as an added protection against flooding. So one such example of non-native vegetation is Russian olive. Russian olive was introduced into North America by the late 19th century. and was both planted and spread through the consumption of its fruits by birds, which dispersed the seeds. Russian olive is considered to be an invasive species in many places in the United States because it thrives on poor soil, has high seeding survival rates, matures in a few years, and outcompetes the native vegetation. 
Russian olive oftentimes invades riparian habitats where the canopy of cottonwood trees has died off. Another such example is Siberian elm. Many of the trees in Albuquerque are Siberian elm, which are in fact listed as a noxious weed by the New Mexico Department of Agriculture. Siberian elms are the large trees in many of our older parks and our older residential areas, in every empty lot, and every street sign post. Siberian elms are quite suitable for Albuquerque, being that they are very hardy, very drought tolerant, and able to thrive in a desert and an urban environment. These trees were first introduced to our city by then mayor Clyde Tingley on the assumption that they would do well here, and they certainly do. It turns out Siberian elms are quite problematic as wind pollinated species. They're prolific pollen producers along with seed producers. Due to their ability to thrive with little water and in poor conditions, Siberian elms have come to dominate areas of the bosque. Some believe that Siberian elms are in fact a willing recruit able to replace the cottonwood of the bosque in the face of global climate change. Tamarisk, also known as salt cedar, again a non-native invasive species here present in the bosque, has naturalized and become a major invasive plant species consuming large amounts of groundwater. The high salt level in tamarisk infiltrates the soil, preventing other plants from growing, creating a tamarisk dominant forest with no understory, void of important habitat for pollinators and other native species. Tamarisk forests also tend to burn hotter than most native riparian trees, worsening the fire hazard of acres of uninterrupted tamarisk and their risk to human structures. Ravenna grass is a relatively new invasive species in the middle of Rio Grande. Ravenna grass grows most uh, mo moist soil riparian habitats, making an ideal candidate to invade construction, constructed habitat restoration sites. Believed to be sold as an ornamental grass in the US for over 90 years, Ravenna grass has taken hold in the bosque. Ravenna grass can outcrowd native species and become a monoculture, displacing mostly riparian and wetland plant species. Due to its long leaves that dry out with its fluffy seed heads, it has a major potential to be a fire spreader. All right, shifting gears here a little bit, uh, the non-native invasive species compounded by drought has led to a new set of ecological challenges for the Bosque ecosystem. So this image here is from the U.S. Drought Monitor from April 6, 2021, indicating much of the Southwest is in a severe to extreme to exceptional drought. This next slide gives a closer look at the drought conditions in New Mexico. As of May 4, 2021, the western part of Bernalillo County is in a severe drought, where central Bernalillo County is in extreme drought, in the eastern part of Bernalillo County being an exceptional drought. This image here is the Vegetation Drought Response Index. As you can see, much of Bernalillo County's vegetative community is again experiencing pre-drought stress to extreme drought. So what does this mean for the vegetative communities in the Middle Rio Grande? Simply, with drought comes wildfire. The Rio Grande Bosque is both part of urban and agricultural communities. It is on a wildland urban interface where fire in one threatens the other. Essentially, a house fire can start a Bosque fire and a Bosque fire can start a house fire. So, so some may remember 18 years ago now, Albuquerque made national news. In particular, a Bosque fire in Albuquerque is what made national news. This, is, this was the first of many large catastrophic wildfires in the Bosque, leading down a path of managing the Bosque to prevent wildfires. It was then the city of Albuquerque's mayor, Marty Chavez, in which he created the Bosque Reclamation Crew housed within the Open Space Division. Bos Bosque Reclamation Crew would be tasked with managing fuel loads in the city of Bosque prevent future catastrophic wildfires. 
With now two, de two decades of reducing the risk of large-scale wildfires in the Bosque, wildfires have largely been smaller in scale and intensity. According to New Mexico State Forestry Division, 534 fires occurred on Middle Rio Grande Conservancy District lands within the Middle Rio Grande Valley from 1993 to 2003, with fires burning in all months of the year. By far, most fires occurred during February through July. Very large fires were not common. Only 4% of all fires burned over 100 acres. Most fires were less than 10 acres in size and 14% of all the fires burning between 10 and 99 acres. All fires that burned over 100 acres occurring during the months of March through June, with 13 of those 23 fires occurring in April, so just last month. Most of these large fires burned in Socorro County. So even more recently, just last month, in fact, a rash of wildfires occurred uh, in and around the Tingley Beach area, all of which were only contained at a few acres. Common causes of Bosque fire include arson, illegal campfires, fireworks, and careless disposal of smoking materials. Fires in the Bosque provide some unique obstacles in suppression. Primary constraint is due to restricted access within the levees, jetty jacks often being the biggest barrier to suppress fires. So, drought compounds wildfires, and wildfires compound the loss of critical habitat. As mature cottonwoods begin to decline, along with the lack of over, overbank flooding events, leading to new recruitment of cottonwoods, combined with the increase of non-native vegetation, significant fuel loads are left on the forest floor. On the screen here is Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Program, also known as BEMP, which is a network of partnerships that includes more than 50 schools and a variety of local, state, federal, and tribal landowners and agencies. BEMP is primarily collect, uh, excuse me, data is collected primarily by K through 12 students and their teachers, demonstrating how local science initiatives like this can su successfully connect people to their landscapes while helping inform resource management policies. This comes into play because BEMP has 32 active sites across 270 miles of Middle Rio Grande, and over 1 million data points are collected each year. As a land manager, uh, I would refer to BEMP's data quite often, and this craft here represent fuel loads from 2004 to 2016. The titles on the bottom are of various BEMP sites, shown on the previous slide, throughout the Middle Rio Grande. The red horizontal line is the threshold for catastrophic fire hazard being measured in tons per acre. Any site above 12 tons per acre can lead to a catastrophic wildfire. Several REMP sites indicate significant fuel loads still exist throughout the Bosque as of 2014, those being the Badger, Diversion, Alameda, and Hispanic Cultural Center sites. The Biopark site, which is actually adjacent to where I'm sitting now, experienced increases in fuel loads from 2004 to 2019, and a gradual decrease through fuel load reduction projects from 2010 to 2014. Significant fuel loads present in the Bosque is largely due to the aging cottonwood trees, dropping branches or whole trees toppling to the forest floor. One of the main strategies used now to prevent fires is the removal of non-native vegetation and down, dead and down woody debris from areas that have not burned. This involves large scale removal of dead trees and fallen branches using heavy equipment such as brush cutters and masticators, or even by hand crews. The wood is typically either removed from the site and offered to the public as firewood, or chipped and spread across the site in an attempt to restore nutrients to the forest floor. I will say removing wood from the site is often the preferred option to actually decrease the fuel loads. Mastication, as seen here, largely does not remove the fuel loads from the bosque, but instead takes the dead and down debris and simply changes the comp composition of the fuel loads. What would be once a 100 hour fuel, being a woody fuel that would burn for 100 plus hours, 
is now turned into mulch that is more likely to be a low intensity fire that will likely smolder. Depth of wood chips on the mosquito floor is also a concern amongst land managers. As learned, depth of wood chips greater than several inches will prevent native grasses to germinate as the seed to soil contact is limited. So flood control measures, dams, non-native invasive species introductions, wildfires, and drought certainly have the odds stacked against the Rio Grande Cottonwood's long-term survivability. However you may look at it, the Rio Grande Cottonwood may have a bit of an ally or maybe even two. Silvery minnow, listed as endangered species in 1994, is largely keeping the Rio Grande Bosque alive today. Through the silvery minnow's unfortunate predicament, habitat restoration efforts bring in significant federal funding to provide suitable habitat for the life cycle of the silvery minnow. Along with the silvery minnow, the Southwestern Willow Flycatcher was listed on the endangered species list in 1995. The Southwestern Willow Flycatcher, also known as the Swiffle, has been documented nesting in the Albuquerque Reach, however, the city bosque predominantly being a stopover for migrating. Southwestern willow flycatchers. It is through habitat restoration efforts, the Southwestern willow flycatcher also benefits by the increase in suitable habitat for nesting. So this is another chart from the Bosque Ecosystem Monitoring Project, providing an explanation of the effects of Bosque disturbance on exotic understory, native understory, exotic canopy, and native canopy. So take note of the bottom left corner of the chart, the disturbance being overbank flooding. Overbank flooding was once a historical ecological function of the Rio Grande and its surrounding floodplain. It is still likely that flooding is the most beneficial bosque disturbance. As a result of overbank flooding, the exotic understory remains low. The native understory begins to dominate. The exotic canopy begins to be outcompeted by native vegetation. This is an important concept to understand as it relates to bosque habitat restoration. By reconnecting the floodplain to the river through habitat restoration projects, allowing for overbanking flood, flood events to occur, the recruitment of cottonwood seedlings and native vegetation to become established is greatly increased. So a little bit more about the Bosque native understory. The native understory of the Bosque largely consists of, consists of New Mexico olive, three-leaf sumac, false indigo, silver buffalo berry, among others. Much of the native understory in the Bosque are fruit-bearing plants, which are integral to providing forage and nesting habitat for a wide variety of resident and neotropical birds that find refuge in the Bosque. So shifting gears a little bit again, uh, these next few, next few slides are an actual habitat restoration project in which I was involved with. Uh, and again, kind of put these theories into practice. As a result of the San Juan Chama Diversion Project, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority was required to mitigate the effects of that particular project. The primary purpose of this habitat restoration project was to create slow moving refugial habitat the silvery minnow needs to spawn. Silvery minnow eggs, they free floating, triggered by spring runoff, or more, more recently, actions determined by water managers to move water down from Cochiti and Alvada reservoirs to the middle Rio Grande to stimulate spring runoff. Secondarily, the habitat restoration sites benefit the southwestern willow flycatcher by creating dense coyote willow stands for nesting. This resulted in the creation of two habitat restoration projects. In 2015, the creation of a six water acre backwater embayment was constructed on the east bank south of Paseo del Norte. So this slide here provides some context into the location of the two habitat restoration sites. On the right side of the image is Paseo del Norte, that being to the north. The blue arrow 
referencing the habitat restoration site on the east bank to the south of Paseo del Norte. This particular site was designed to inundate at 1,000 cubic feet per second from its southern end with the tiered bank lowered and backfilling to the north at 2,500 cubic feet per second. By lowering the riverbank and reestablishing the connection to the floodplain, native vegetation is able to reach groundwater through revegetation efforts. So this picture here on the screen shows the vegetative community pre-construction. Uh, again, this habitat restoration site was dominated by approximately four acres of salt cedar, Russian olive, and Siberian elm. Two components of many of these rest restoration efforts is removal of non-native vegetation and revegetation of native species. So this image here is of the initial clearing and grubbing of non-native vegetation. Many of the large mature cottonwoods and native vegetation were identified and retained within the site. Shown here are the trunks of Siberian elm trees, which were actually bucked into firewood sized pieces and distributed throughout the city of Albuquerque to senior citizens through a partnership with the city of Albuquerque Senior Affairs. Jetty jacks no longer serving their intended purpose were broken down, piled, and removed from the site. So there's a kind of a before and after. Heavy equipment is seen here, beginning the initial phases of the bank lowering process. While this type of work can, can be seen as intrusive and destructive, careful consideration is made into site selection and methods of creating these types of habitat restoration features. Rigorous federal environmental and biological assessments are conducted years in advance before the first grain of sand is ever moved. So post dirt removal, revegetation of native species to include cottonwood, cottonwoods and coyote willow and native riparian shrubs took place. As seen here on the trailer are bundles of harvested coyote willows to be installed throughout the site. Interesting characteristic of both cottonwoods and coyote willows is that they're free phytes, meaning one can cut a live branch or new growth from a living specimen and replant within the threshold of the water table and grow a new specimen. Survival rates for this particular site have been in the 70% range. Much of the initial work of digging down to the water table is done with heavy equipment. As seen here, the bobcat skid steer is augering approximately six feet to reach the water table for cottonwoods to be planted. Cottonwoods, cottonwood poles that were pre previously harvested are staged for planting. Revegetation efforts take place when the trees are dormant. As spring rolls around, the newly planted poles expire their energy developing roots and leaves. The orange flags in the background indicate the previously augered holes. In this particular site, the water table averaged eight to 10 feet, thus the remaining dirt is removed by using hand augers. So through manual labor, a variety of sizes of augers and shovels and just brute force, the water table is reached to begin, the water table is reached to begin planting cottonwood poles. So through a partnership with the Albuquerque Water Utility Authority, known as the River Exchange Program, students learn about the Rio Grande and a partner river elsewhere in the nation. So here, seventh and eighth graders are on a field trip assisting the city of Albuquerque's open space division plant cottonwood poles. So not only are the students learning about watersheds, the importance of the bosque, where their drinking water comes from, they're also becoming featured stewards of the bosque. Many of the young cottonwood poles installed are wrapped with chicken wire cages to prevent beaver depredation, as you can see here. This image here is of an open space employee hydro seeding a native bosque seed mix in disturbed areas to outcompete any potential weed infestations such as kochia and tumbleweed. 
As of April 2016, 3,370 total plant units were installed at the Paseo del Norte Southeast Habitat Restoration Site. Specifically, 400 of those being cottonwood trees and 2,000 coyote willows. Native understory shrubs were also planted in the amount of 600. Ongoing revegetation re efforts have taken place and uh, overall increasing the total plant units significantly. So approximately 25 acres of native bosque grass seed mix were hydro seeded in June of 2015 and experienced pretty significant germination rates. So throughout this particular project, photo points were established. So this next series of photos kind of just demonstrates the progression of the project along with the vegetation communities being established. So these particular images are from the perspective of the southerly most point of the habitat restoration site looking north towards Paseo del Norte. Uh, again, this particular image here on the screen shows pre-construction conditions with the site predominantly occupied by non-native vegetation. This next image is of the site post-clearing and grubbing of native to non-native vegetation. Mastication of non-native non vegetation was the method used for this particular project, largely due to the fact that the, much of this material would later be removed from the site. Seen here is the excavation of the site taking place. And again, this image is of continued excavation nearing the completion of the project. Perhaps one more of the exciting times in this project, the actual restoration site was finally connected to the river itself. When it came to connect the restoration site to the river, runoff had increased significantly within the river system, which had equipment operators working in a fast and coordinated effort. Again, with increased flows in the Rio Grande, the site immediately began to serve its intended purpose. You can see in the middle of the site, groundwater begins to be ponding. In May of 2015, the river's flow reached approximately 1,600 cubic feet per second, just enough volume of water to begin inundating the first tier of the site. As seen here, the site is inundating from the south back to the north. This particular spring runoff coincided with the seed shower of the cottonwoods, which would later lead to a significant recruitment of cottonwood seedlings within the habitat feature itself. Later in May, with even more increased runoff, this image here shows the extent of the site when inundated. Again, in June 2016, the Rio Grande experienced significant runoff, leading to the site being inundated for several weeks. Take note of the salt cedar in the foreground of this image here. Through continued maintenance and treatment, much of the non-native vegetation has largely been kept at bay within the site. Habitat restoration features, being part of a dynamic, dynamic system, require continual and routine maintenance. Post-treatment of the non-native vegetation by hand crews, Coyote Willow is able to establish, as seen here in the foreground of this particular image. Again, if you look closely enough, cottonwood seedlings are within the excavated site after the spring runoff has receded. So jumping forward two years in time to May 2018, much of the coyote will in the foreground of the previous image was depredated on by beavers and would later be reestablished. Much of the site itself is, begin is beginning to become vegetated with native vegetation, predominantly cottonwood seed seedlings and coyote willow. So here's a bit of a better perspective of the establishment of vegetation along with the inundation of the site. So 
So I was able to make it back to the site just last month, April of 2021, in fact, in preparation for this presentation. Many of the cottonwoods that were once seedlings are now reaching heights of 25 to 30, so 25 to 30 feet, with thick fat patches of coyote willow and thriving native shrubs. So this is a Google Earth aerial image of the site, offering a bit of a different perspective, north being at the top of the screen and south at the bottom. So here's yet another kind of different perspective of the Paseo del Norte Southeast Restoration Site. This image gives you uh, yet another perspective. This particular image actually being taken from a helicopter with the site being fully inundated. So the vegetative community with the Bosque has largely changed due to flood control measures. Now, the adult cottonwoods of the Bosque are nearing death. Due to the lack of flooding, the river has not created new habitats for cottonwood seedlings to grow into saplings and mature trees. Instead, what is replacing them is a shade tolerant exotic understory. If we continue to let this happen, the heart of the bosque and the sacred cottonwood will no longer support the beautiful Bosque's, bosque ecosystem. Furthermore, with extreme climatic events threatening habitat loss, invasive species encroachment, along with water diversions and altered stream flows. Active habitat restoration and adaptive management will be one of the keys to sustain Rio Grande cottonwood populations throughout the middle Rio Grande. By bringing the bosque to the river through lowering the flood, by lowering the floodplain to promote its inundation of adequate flows, land managers We'll also be able to create a dynamic patchwork mosaic of saltgrass meadows, oxbows, cottonwood dominated overstories, and native understories. It's through habitat restoration efforts such as this one, combined with adaptive management, that will help to further sustain cottonwood populations in the Rio Grande Bosque as we know it for future restorations. The river ecosystem is adaptive, but just how adaptive is a question that lingers. Thank you.